What's going on, everyone? My name is Devin Sears. I work with Bluehost. I'm their field marketing manager. That means I, in my humble opinion, have the greatest job in the world. I get to travel around all across the country and go to a bunch of different events. While I'm at these events, I get to meet a lot of interesting people, um, a lot of people that are very uh, experienced in their field. Today, we are going to chat with one of my good friends from Arizona. His name's Scott Deluzio, and here is Scott. So, hey, everyone. Scott, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping first. We're just going to pin what we're talking about today. Um, so anyone that tunes in a little bit late um, is caught up. And I was just telling them okay. that my job with Bluehost is essentially to travel around the country and go to different events and meet people. And with the current state of affairs, I'm not traveling as much. Uh, I'm not traveling at all, to be <laughs> specific. And so we thought we'd do this little series where we bring on friends from the community uh, and give, give everyone, all of Bluehost's viewers, a little bit of a taste of what goes on at some of these events, bring on people that are experts in their field. So um, today we're bringing on Scott Deluzio, so everyone hit the little heart button, show Scott some love, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about recurring billing. So Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, a little bit about your background, and a little bit about what you do. Yeah, sure. Uh, so my, my business is uh, Amplify Plugins. We build primarily uh, e-commerce uh, add-ons for uh, like WooCommerce, uh, easy digital downloads, things like that. And, um, you know, so, so that's kind of my background, uh, like what, what I do now, I got into that, um, by, uh, I, I started off building websites for clients, um, and I was building plugins just to kind of scratch my own itch, things that I saw as a, a need for my own use cases or my clients. Um, and then I decided that, uh, selling the plugins was, was a whole lot more enjoyable to me. And so I, I sort of transitioned my business into, uh, selling the plugins in, instead of, uh, you know, building the, the client sites. So, so that's, it's kind of a, me in a nutshell where, where I came from and, you know, what, I, what I've been up to and, and things like that. Cool. Well, as I mentioned before, uh, today we're talking about recurring billing. So, um, building plugins, it seems like, you know, when, once you build it, it's got, you, you package it up and ship it out and sell it. Right. I mean. How, how long have you, have you always been in a recurring billing business or has that changed? Yeah. So I, when I first started, like I said, I, I started off uh, not primarily selling plugins. I was, I was just selling them on the side, just a little extra cash. And I, I wasn't really paying that much attention to it um, because my primary income was coming from, uh, you know, building sites for, for clients and things like that. So um, I, I didn't really pay too much attention to the plugin sales, you know, whether or not year over year I was doing better or worse. It was just, you know, a little bit of money here and there. Um, it was just kind of a nice side income. But after transitioning away from the client sites, I, I took a look at the, the new renewal rates and, and things like that uh, and realized that I needed quite a bit of help. So that's where I, I looked into the recurring billing option and uh, you know, getting uh, automated renewals on the on the plugin. So year after year, uh, customers are are coming back and recurring. Uh, uh, you know, uh, re renewing their subscription, I should say, to the plugin uh, support and all that that kind of stuff. And that's really helped grow the business uh, from from there. Okay, very cool. And for for viewers that are tuning in, um, two things. One is an item of business. If you have any questions that come up go ahead and send those in the comment box. Uh, we'll try to get to all of them that we can. And uh, I believe we have had a couple comments that have come in over the past day as we put this on our Insta story. But um, just for anyone that's just barely tuning in, feel free to ask questions as they come up and we'll try to get to them. Um, but for, vi for viewers that are just tuning in or that might not be familiar, can you give your best definition of what recurring billing is? Yeah, I guess in a, in a sentence, it's uh, just really a way to uh, charge a customer on a regular basis for a product or service. Um, and I mean, we're, I think we're all familiar with this model and maybe not necessarily familiar with the, the term, uh, the terminology or whatever. Um, I mean, Bluehost is a, a perfect example of a recurring uh, billing model. Uh, you sign up for a hosting account, you get charged a certain amount uh, per month or year or whatever, depending on the, the plan that you sign up for. Uh, and, and that's, that's sort of, uh, the the gist of a recurring billing model in a, you know kind of a nutshell there right okay and so you mentioned bluehost we do have a recurring billing method um 
who do you think should be using if, if someone's just like a smaller business is the recurring billing for them or is it only once you get to a larger size corporation that you should look into this? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think any business, uh, any size business, I should say, could be able to, to utilize recurring billing uh, in, in their business to help grow the, uh, their revenue. Um, you know, if you offer a product or a service um, on a regular basis, it just makes sense to automate that as, as much as possible. Um, it reduces the chance that a customer isn't going to renew their, their subscription uh, to your product or service. Um, think about how much of a pain it would be if you had to remember to uh, renew your uh, Netflix sub subscription every month. Uh, you know, if you had to like go in and log into the, to their website or whatever to renew your, your Netflix or Hulu or whatever. Um, they automate it. And uh, uh, whether you realize it or not, you're actually happier uh, that they do uh, automate it. So you don't have to go through all those hoops. Um, the other nice thing is that it helps you to forecast your future income. Um, you know, so if you, if you know that you have a certain number of customers today or you know, on whatever month, and on average, you gain about 10 customers a month, um, and maybe you lose two, um, uh, you know, every month or whatever, uh, you can fairly accurately predict what your income is going to look like next month, two months from now, uh, you know, six months from now, even, um, you know, based on, on that. And of course there's, there's going to be, uh, less accurate forecasts the further you go out because things are going to change, uh, obviously you know, the way the, the world is going right now, things have changed and we, we weren't ex exactly expecting this to be happening six months ago. But, um, you know, the, the further you look out, the less accurate those predictions will be. But um, you can adjust those forecasts over time, too. So you can, you can still have some sort of accurate uh, level of, of uh, predictions there and forecasting. Um, so really, it, it's good for any size business um, and that, that wants to have maybe a little more stable income, uh, you know, over, over time. Okay, so... Uh, is I mean it sounds like it's it's pretty much good for for anyone right and anyone that yeah. maybe you can project it your income it sounds like it, it makes business especially for a small business where you know if you're a contractor and you're not entirely sure what sales will look like one month to the next it, it sounds like it's really beneficial it is uh, yeah so, and, and yeah go ahead yeah I, I was just going to ask the next question how does someone going about setting up recurring billing yeah, there's a lot of tools that you can use um, uh, to set up recurring billing. Uh, if you're using WordPress, which I, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say probably a lot of the people who are listening to this right now probably are using WordPress. Um, there's there's plugins that you can use. I, I think I saw actually a, a, someone had a comment about that uh, just a little while ago. Uh, there are plugins that you can use. Um, WooCommerce WooCommerce subscriptions is one that if you're selling uh, physical products is is really good. Uh, that you can use that. Um, or Easy Digital Downloads has their recurring payments uh, plugin, um, which if you're selling uh, digital goods, um, you know, maybe it's music or photographs or, or things like that, you can, you can use that. Or even services, you can, you can use that uh, fairly, fairly easily. Um, so those, will, those two plugins will cover most of the physical and digital products or services that you might be selling. Um, but you also might want to sell things like courses or memberships. Um, there's other plugins that you can use. Uh, LearnDash, uh, Lifter LMS uh, are good for uh, courses. Um, Restrict Content Pro, Paid Memberships Pro, and I'm sure there's plenty of others out there that, that you can do for, for membership type sites where you might want to have exclusive member only content, uh, you know, kind of behind a paywall or something like that. You could do, do that type of thing. Okay. Too. So it sounds like there's a lot of tools out there. So um uh, hopefully we can we can link off somewhere that has some of these resources so the viewers can go and and uh look at these in a little bit more depth later but maybe before sure. we get to that um can you maybe give a little a couple tips on how our viewers should go about evaluating which service is right for them i mean you, you mentioned a couple plugins um I, i'm sure you're going to want to look at credit card processors as well what what kind of right. things should they be looking for when they're evaluating these services yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things that I would want to pay attention to is the, the payment gateway, the payment processor uh, that, that you're going to use to handle these subscriptions. Um, because once when you're, you're on that, so let's say you pick Stripe or, or PayPal, uh, there's, there's a number of others, but those are the two more common ones. Um, uh, both, both of those can handle the subscriptions for you. Um, but once when you're on there and you have someone's credit card being charged through Stripe, for example, um, it's going to be a real pain to, to move to another provider uh, if you decide that 
you know, for some reason, Stripe isn't, isn't quite cutting, cutting it for you, or it's not offering, uh, you know, the, the rates that you want or, or whatever. Um, so it's going to be a little bit more of a pain to, to move. So you want to do your homework and, and really research those, uh, those payment processors uh, before you jump in and just start using, uh, using it. Um, uh, like I said, both of the, like Stripe and PayPal can handle the, the subscriptions. Um, but in the payment gateway, you want to, you also want to make sure that you, both you as the store owner and your customers can upgrade, uh, downgrade, or cancel their, their subscriptions altogether if they want uh, to, to whatever the, the, the service or product is that you're offering. Um, but like a, a Stripe and PayPal are both going to have those options. Most, most of the, the payment gateways will have that type of option. You just want to make sure before you jump in on it. Um, you also want to make sure that the e-commerce uh, software, the plugin uh, that you're using, like WooCommerce or Easy Digital Downloads or, or whatever the case may be, uh, whatever that you're using, uh, has in, an integration with that payment gateway. Uh, you don't want to have to rely on, um, you know, coding it yourself or, you know, trying to figure out how to hack together some sort of solution. Uh, you know, if they, they have that already in place. Um, you know that they will be able to keep up with any changes to the payment gateway if they 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 should come up over time and, and things like that. Hacking it together is definitely the open source way, <laughs> but there there's yeah. also a, a much easier way out there. There is, um, yeah. And and when you're when you're dealing with things like payments, like that, that's kind of the the lifeline of your business. Uh, you don't really want to. Uh, Wor you know, be working with a hack together solution. Um, you you want to have a team of developers who are familiar with the, the software and, and know what they're doing, who, who can support it. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm all for, you know, putting together your own solutions for, you know, those custom edge cases or, you know, other, you know, f uh, features that you might have. But uh, when you're talking about things like payments, uh, that, that, that is something that's a little bit more critical to your business and, and you need to make sure that that's, that's working 100% of the time. Yeah, and uh, it, it looks like one of our viewers asked a question, what about Stripe? Uh, Jartra, I, I believe that you did cover that. You mentioned that and PayPal are two of the more popular ones. Um, but if, if someone is not sure if their plugin or their theme will work for it, is that something that they should reach out to the, to the plugin or theme developer? Or is it before they install it, they should go and just do a little bit of research on, on whatever item they're going to install to make sure that it has compatibility with their payment processor? Yeah, it, it never would hurt to reach out to the, the plugin developer, uh, you know, reach out to WooCommerce support or Easy Digital Download support or any of the other plugins. I'm, I'm using those because those are, are you know, fairly popular options. But uh, any of the plugin developers, reach out to them and say, hey, this is what I'm planning on doing. This is the type of site that I'm, I'm trying to set up. Um, I, I want to just make sure that this integration is solid. It, it'll work for what it is that I'm, I'm trying to do. Um, and they should be able to help you out with, with that. So, you know, that, that, that'll never hurt to, to reach out to them. Okay. Yeah. And that, that is one of the things that I absolutely love about WordPress plugins and WordPress community, honestly, is that you, usually you can reach out to the developer, the creator, and they're fairly approachable. You know, it's, right. it's not like, um, I'm trying to think, uh, I, I don't want to say any companies and, and get in trouble, but I think we've probably all had run in with companies where you're trying to get in touch with them and uh, you're sitting on hold for half an hour. The number you have, you found on their website doesn't actually reach them. So that's for sure. One of the things that I really like about the WordPress ecosystem is it seems like a lot of people are, are approachable and are willing to talk to you and, and work with you if you're using their product. Um, yeah. One of the things that you mentioned that I kind of want to circle back on is churn. Um, you mentioned that mm -hmm. the recurring revenue can help you retain customers. You mentioned before that, you know, you might sign up 10 a month, but have two drop off. Can you talk a little bit about how you think recurring revenue or recurring billing helps retain customers? Yeah. Uh, so first off, uh, with, with churn what, and, and dropping off customers and things like that, one of the hardest things a business has to do is get new customers. Um, you know, that, that's like one of the hardest things to do is to get, get those customers in the door or, you know, hand over their, their credit card information to, to actually start billing them. Um, and it's absolutely in, insane to, to go through all of the trouble to get a new customer uh, just to let them go, you know, potentially never to be heard from again. You know, if they, they come, they buy something from you and they're, they're super happy with it and then they just, you know, disappear and then they never hear from you again. That, that's, that's not the best way to, to keep them, uh, you know, coming back uh, to, to you. Um, once when you get a customer on a recurring ba basis, those, those little uh, 
pesky things will pop up like uh, credit cards will expire or are, are canceled. Um, you know, those things are, are sort of out, of out of your control. Um, but they're, they're also a, sometimes a common issue. Um, and, and if your, your customers don't update, they update their credit card information with your service or product or whatever, um, it, you know, you're, you're going to end up losing that customer because their, their card expired and then they're going to drop off as, as a subscriber. And they may not even realize that they're, that the card that they were using has, has expired. Um, so you can use services like, um, there, there's a service called Churnbuster that I use. Um, and there's a few others, uh, similar services, uh, that will basically prompt the customer to update their credit card, uh, whenever a charge fails. Um, and, and this way, using a service like that, you'll end up losing fewer customers to those avoidable things like, like their credit card expired or things like that. The reason why I mentioned Churnbuster is because I, I actually use Churnbuster myself in my business. And one of the other things that you can do to help, help your business retain customers is show the value that you're offering to those customers. Um, in, in Churnbuster, um, I was looking at some of the statistics and over the last year, I made uh, way more money based on the, the amount of um, customers that they were able to retain for me by, by sending out those emails to update credit cards and things like that. Way more money than I actually spend on their service. And so to me, it's a no brainer. Like I, it's, it's almost like printing free money. So, so when I see that, I, I see that my money is well spent with their service and I'm going to happily sign up again next year or, you know, renew again next year, because I just know that over the course of the year, I'm going to end up better off uh, financially because I'm going to get more money in than I'm spending out on, on the subscription for their service. So, so one of the things that you can do in your business is just make sure that the value that you're offering them is uh, to, to your customers is something that's, that's in their face. And it's like really obvious to them. They know that that you're offering this, this service and, uh, and this is the benefit that they're getting out of it. Um, you know, if, if you can do something like show how much money you're saving them or uh, getting them in, in income and, and things like that, then, then do that. And then they'll, they'll have less of an issue when it comes time to renew each year. Um, you know, if, it, if you're charging a hundred dollars a year and you're, you're saving them a thousand and you can show that some way, I mean, there, there's, it's a no brainer. Like why wouldn't someone sign up for that? You know? Right. And, and I think that's a great tip, especially for someone that's a small business or an entrepreneur that's just getting started. You know, when you start, oftentimes as a solopreneur, you know, you're, you're the you're the one man band. It's up to mm -hmm. you, your customer service, your sales, you're the CEO, you you know, sometimes you're the janitor, sometimes, you know, sometimes you're the, the head of marketing. And I, yeah. I think a, a tool like Churnbuster is the closest thing you can get to, to hiring like a retention center. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I think, I think that's a really good tip. Everyone should write that down or mash the, the heart button, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so going with that, you, you also mentioned um, sometimes people charge by the month, sometimes people charge by the year. Do you have any recommendations on what billing cycles people should be looking at as, as they're going through this? Yeah, it, it really is going to depend on the, the product or service that, that's being offered. Um, uh, and, and also, it's going to depend on what the customer expects. Um, so, for example, uh, two common examples of, of some sort of recurring uh, you know, billing is like uh, the, the streaming services. Like I mentioned Netflix before, but like, you know, so Netflix, Hulu, they, they charge on a monthly basis. But let's say a new competitor comes into the market and all of a sudden they're charging on a weekly basis or an annual basis or something like that. Um, customers are going to kind of be put off a little bit because they're, they're already expecting that their streaming service that they're using is going to be billing them on a monthly basis. And so they're, they're, they may not expect that. And it may be a little bit harder for them to wrap their heads around a, an annual, uh, you know, streaming service subscription or a, uh, a weekly or daily, or I don't know. So whatever the, the, the frequencies are that they, they're using. Um, they may not react too well to that. So um, one of the things that I, I would suggest is to look at other uh, other competitors in, in the market. Um, you know, so Bluehost, for example, there's obviously other, um, you know, hosting competitors that are that are out there. Um, you know, if, if I was going to start my own uh, hosting company, 
I would look to see what Bluehost is doing and what other competitors are, are doing in, in that, that market. Um, and I would look to try to try to model my billing after them, uh, you know, unless there was some reason that I, I shouldn't do that. Like maybe I'm offering something that I'm, I'm providing a different, different level of service or a different, um, you know, value proposition or something like that, where it makes sense to do it on a, uh, you know, either a weekly or a annual basis or, or whatever the case may be. Um, but, you know, basically you, you want to try to keep that, that freak, the billing frequency uh, kind of tied to how frequently the, the customer is actually going to be using the, the product or service. So, you know, if it's a, um, a food subscription uh, type thing, you know, and, and you send a uh, weekly meal or something like that, then, you know, a weekly uh, billing is, is probably sufficient at that point. Um, yeah, you know, if you send it once a month, then, then a monthly billing is, is sufficient. So it really, it's going to depend. Uh, there's no one answer that I can give for, for all, uh, you know, options there, you know. Uh, but there, there's also something else that that goes into it is 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 kind of what I talked about a little bit earlier, but the the psychology that goes behind it, um, and you know you can even do things where you play around with the prices, where you advertise a monthly rate of you know ten dollars a month, but you you charge the, charge annually uh, for for that that amount, you know, and and you can play around with that and see see what works for for people, it, you know. So some customers may respond well to that, some may not. Um, you know, that, that's where you can kind of do a split, like A-B test kind of thing and see, see what works for, for your business. Sure. Uh, I am grateful that Netflix does not charge uh, according to my use. Otherwise, <laughs> I would have gotten a staggering bill uh, for when I streamed a, a certain new show about large tigers, we'll say. Uh, you know, if, if they charge me every time I use it, I just, you know, might as well cut up my credit card bill. But yeah, it's right. interesting, different... Uh, different companies use different frequencies. You know, like you said, Netflix is monthly. I feel like most gyms are monthly. I, I recently paid uh, for my car insurance, but they charge six months at a time. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's, it's kind of all over the place, but you, you brought up something that I thought was kind of interesting, which is what is, what is the norm and what is kind of accepted as common practice in that realm, right. In that neighborhood. And mm -hmm. it kind of made me think if, if someone that's watching this is thinking about doing this, if they don't have competitors that are doing a recurring revenue model, then they might have an opportunity to be the first in, in that circle, so to speak, to set that up. And yeah, if they can absolutely. become the standard, then I feel like that gives them an edge up on, on their competition um, to, uh, to set the standard for, for that industry, which I, yeah, I think is, that... yeah. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, so with everything that's going on right now, uh, I wanted to throw a couple different businesses that people may or may not think of as a regular recurring billing model. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can kind of just spitball it and think about uh, off the cuff of different ways that you might be able to adapt that business to a recurring yeah. business model. Does that sound good? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so the I'll, I'll start with a, an easy one. Let, let's go with a website developer or a website designer. How, how might they might adapt a recurring billing method? Yeah, so maintenance plans are the first thing that, that comes to mind for me with that. Um, it, it's great for, for those types of businesses where you, you maintain the, the client's website, uh, keep it running, maybe even uh, offer hosting. I'm, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of hosting uh, or a lot of uh, designers or developers can have a like a reseller plan through through their hosting company where they can they can do that type of thing. So that, that's another way that that they can do it. Um, downside to you know because you're you're asking about um, you know given the the current climate with the um, you know everything that's going on right now, um, you know a lot of businesses may not have the budget for um, for for building a a, a uh, or, or having a maintenance plan, that, that type of thing. Um, another thing that you can do, which is sort of along those lines, is is to not charge for building a website up, up front. Um, uh, I know it kind of sounds nuts, but hear me out. Um, you could you could charge someone a flat monthly fee for, let's say, the next three years, um, and during that time, you handle all the hosting, the site maintenance, uh, the upkeep, and all the, the things that go, up, go into it. Um, maybe you charge them $200 a month, um, at the end of three years, that works out to $7,200. Um, it might sound like a bad deal for you, but if you add uh, like two clients a month, I did the math. Um, I'm just looking at my screen right now. Um, if you do add two clients per month at this, 
uh, by the end of the first year, you'll have a, a business that's making $4,800 a month. Uh, by the end of the second year, you'll be making $9,600 a month. And it just keeps going up and up from there. Um, you know, obviously, there's going to be some customers who drop off during that time, but, but you'll, you'll end up smoothing out your income. Um, so you don't end up getting that typical feast or famine, uh, you know, peaks and valleys uh, situation that, that a lot of people find themselves in. Okay. That, yeah, I think, I think that's a great idea. I mean, it, it, I'm sold. <laughs> Uh, we, we had a viewer ask, what about photography or uh, events biz? I think that's a great question. Yeah, so like a photography business, um, uh, th those things are, are typically like a one-off type of thing. Um, uh, I know of a photographer in our area that, that does photography lessons. Um, you know, I don't know the specifics of how the lessons work and like what the billing frequency is or any of that kind of stuff, but you could do something like, uh, like a weekly or a monthly class where you teach other people how to, uh, do what you do, the type of photography that you do. Maybe it's wedding photography, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, high school, uh, portrait, uh, pictures, those types of things. Um, and some people get scared off by that because they think that they're just going to create new competition. But there's there's a lot of people who want their pictures taken. There's a lot of opportunity out there. You know, I think that the market's probably big enough that you can you can handle that. Um, but also in reality, it also helps to show your value that you're you're able to to teach these people. Um, and so obviously you know what you're doing if people are willing to pay you for for your um, for your expertise. Um, you can also do things like stock photos, um, sell those. Uh, that's not really a recurring thing unless you like package it somehow. Um, you know, if you have a large uh, portfolio of pictures, you can maybe uh, do a monthly uh, type of thing like that. Um, you know, so so you can do do different things like that. Right. You you might have to get a little bit creative. Um, for, yeah. For everyone that uh, that has just tuned in, right now we're talking with Scott Deluzio about the power of recurring billing. Um, which is essentially instead of charging a single fee up front for your services to continue charging a, a smaller fee, you know, similar to Netflix, you know, charge once a month or something like that. And right now playing a little game where I'm throwing him a couple different uh, businesses that perhaps Bluehost customers might have built um, and, and seeing how he would adapt them to a monthly or just a recurring revenue model. So the next one on the docket is a local bakery. Let's say I've got, the best cookies around how do i how do i turn that into a, a monthly or or just a recurring rev, revenue stream you know one of the the first things uh that that came to mind with when you said bakery was um you know especially now nowadays with the 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 all the uncertainty that's going on in the world and you know people just aren't going out to, to bakeries to buy their you know cookies or muffins or uh, you know pastries things like that um but there, there's still people who have a need for, for that type of stuff. So um, think about like all the, the first responders or those essential employees that, that are out there, um, the hospitals, the police department, fire, EMS, uh, you know, things like that. Um, try, to, try to see if you can reach out to those, those people and get them to subscribe to like a daily pastry delivery for, for breakfast or, or, or something like that. Um, you know, think about a, a hospital where there's a ton of different departments like maternity, ICU, emergency, that cancer uh, section. They have all those those places have doctors and nurses and custodians and uh, everything else that, that that goes into it. Um, and and all of those people, they, they eat breakfast every day, most likely. I'm, I'm assuming, you know, if they're anything like me, they probably eat breakfast <laughs> every day. Right. Yeah. But they, they also have I mean, with everything that's going on, they have so much stuff on their minds and and the the last thing in the world they should have to be worrying about is where am i going to get breakfast because my favorite coffee shop is closed uh you know i can't go there or or if i can the the drive through line is down out to the street and it's it's right. really crazy so you know take one more thing off their plate and and deliver that stuff to to those those places to the hospitals to the police departments to uh you know the fire stations things like that um, you know, that, that's, that's one way that you can, you can build a recurring thing. And that would be a, on a daily basis. You know, every, every day they're going to, they're going to need to restock. Um, you know, you can, you can send in, uh, you know, muffins or donuts, that, that type of thing. Um, you know, maybe even you have some healthier options and, and that type of stuff. Uh, you can, you can supplement it with coffee uh, and, and you can deliver that stuff on a daily basis. And now all of a sudden you have this recurring stream that, that, you know, day after day after day, you're going to have these, these customers 
who are who are basically expecting to have breakfast, you know, sitting there when they get into into work in the morning, you know. Right. Uh, we had another question from the viewer. Um, I don't know if you'll have an answer for this. I have a guess at it, but I'll, I'll throw it at you and see if you got something for us. Someone asked it, what about living outside the U.S.? You know, what, what alternatives are there to recurring billing? Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, in, I didn't see the question come through. So what, was it in terms of um, like someone who's outside the U.S. to sell to people in the U.S.? Or was uh, wh where was that going with it? They, they didn't say it. It just said, I live okay. outside of the U.S. What alternatives are there to recurring billing? Uh, the thought that I had was, uh, if you're selling something online um, or even, you know, like a local bakery. Oh, oh, he said the, the, sorry, the viewer said that okay, there's no strike there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, there's, there's many ways that you can have recurring billing. You don't, you don't necessarily, honestly, you don't even necessarily need a website or uh, the, these, uh, you need, don't even need to uh, accept credit cards necessarily. Um, landscapers, for example, um, you know, like I, I have someone who cuts my grass every, every other week and, and I write them a check, at, you know, once a month or, or whatever to, to pay them for, for cutting my grass, um, you know, and so you don't necessarily need uh, that type of thing. You, you can do a recurring um, uh, service or product or, or, or things like that, and, and you don't need to have the, um, the infrastructure of the, the credit card gateways, uh, you know, payment gateways and, and all that kind of stuff. You can do it through cash or check or whatever the preferred payment method is in, in your area, um, you know, whatever country you might be in. Cool. I like it. Um, if there's any follow-up questions to that, just, just let us know in the comments. Uh, there's a couple more on my list that I wanted to hear from you. Uh, what about a gym, you know, specifically with how things are set up right now? Yeah. A gym, that's, that's, it's pretty hard to go to. Yeah, gym. I mean, most of the gyms. I mean, all the gyms around us uh, are closed uh, these days. I, I don't. I don't think any of them are open, or if they are, no one's going to them. Um, so you're gonna have to kind of get a little bit creative with that. Um, but if you offered at your gym, if you offered classes like yoga classes or uh, things like that, um, you can reach out directly to the members of, of those classes um, and ask them to continue their their subscription, their membership to to that class. Um, and then you can use a, like a virtual class option. So, uh, if you have like a yoga class, like I, I said, if you, if you do that every day at six o'clock, um, you can keep doing that class at six and, um, but just make it available online so that people continue that same routine, that same schedule that they, that they normally would have, you know, they, they always, every day they, they go to yoga class at six or, or whatever. Um, but just make it available online. Um, you know, the instructor would just have a camera hooked up to a private uh, Zoom meeting uh, room or, or something like that, maybe Skype or whatever the uh, tool is that you want to use. Um, and then send the link out to, to all of the members of, of the class so, so that they, they can get access to it. Um, and with, with one of Zoom's, uh, Zoom is a, a tool that I use in, in my own business, but with one of their paid plans, you can do like a webinar uh, style thing so that you don't have to worry about um, you know, people taking, taking over, I, I, I've seen in the news, people have been taking over, uh, you know, zoom bombing or whatever in, in the, uh, uh, some of these public meetings and stuff like that. So you can, um, you can do a webinar style thing where, where no one else has, has access to kind of interact, um, they, but they can sit there and they can watch and, and learn from the instructions. Right. Do you, do you know of any plugins off the cuff that, uh, could be beneficial for pay gating? I'm assuming if you're doing a gym or, you know, selling, seats to a class or something like that, you'd want to pay gate access to yeah. that, that video stream. Yeah. Uh, any of the membership uh, plugins that, that they have uh, that, that we had mentioned earlier, uh, restrict content pro is one paid memberships pro. Um, and there's a few others that are just not coming to me right now. Um, but you can, you can do a search on, on wordpress.org um, and, and you can find a, a list of, of membership plugins that, that are out there. Um, you can use any of those, um, and you can, you can make it so that the link to the zoom, uh, you know, recording or, or whatever, or to the, the live, uh, thing is, is in there. And then people actually have to log into it and then they, they can maybe, maybe even you can embed it and, and they can watch it on live on your site or, or something like that. Um, or, or you can even record a lot of, a lot of different trainings, um, 
and you can make them available so that people don't even need to be in your, your local area. You can sell these, these yoga classes to anyone, anyone in the world, really, you know, if the, the quality is there. That's true. You could, uh, you could adapt it to be like a Udemy course or something like that, where yeah. you don't even need to teach the class live. You could just record it in your studio with no one around and then package it. You might even be able to put a little bit more of a production value and, you know, and say the name of the yoga move across the bottom as you're doing it or something like that and, and right. then package it that way. That's a good idea. I like that. Um, okay. Two more on my list. What about uh, a restaurant? I know right now where I'm at locally, which is Austin, Texas, um, we're being dissuaded from going in and sitting down at restaurants. Any, any recommendations right. on how they might be able to pivot and adjust in this trying? Yeah. Time? The same, same thing here. Um, we've, we've done a lot of, you know, like takeout and stuff to kind of help some of these local businesses, but it's, it's hard for them. But um, we're also doing a lot of cooking at home, um, you know, because we just don't want to go out and, you know, risk that kind of exposure that, that, that might, might end up happening. Um, but, you know, some, some people who are in our shoes where they're, they're finding themselves cooking at home for the first time, maybe ever, <laughs> um, they might, they might not be very good at, at cooking. They may not be a great cook. So you can offer online cooking classes, uh, to, to those, those people. Um, and so that way they can, they can learn how to cook. Um, it's not going to stop them. If they weren't good cooks before, they're not going to all of a sudden discover I, this passion for cooking necessarily. And then they're going to never be a customer again, once when all of this kind of blows over. Um, you know, so, so you don't have to worry about losing customers in the future because you, you're doing this, like you're, you're going to help these people out and they're going to remember that. And then they'll, they'll come back to you in, in the future uh, to, to eat at your restaurant. But as, as a bonus to that, to the cooking classes, uh, you, you can even have it so that, uh, you know, on, on Wednesday, you're going to offer, uh, you know, a class on how to make a certain dish. And you can say Wednesday morning, you can come in and you can pick up all the ingredients that you're going to need for this dish. So you can, you're selling the ingredients to the customer and you're also selling access to the, to the course, or you can bundle it somehow, whatever makes sense. Um, and that, that way, you know, Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening, you're, you're doing the class online and that you know that they already have all the ingredients that they need, the, you know, whether it's the, the meat or the pasta or the rice or whatever the spices and things like that that they might need. Uh, they can have all that stuff. Um, and then you can even record, like we were saying before with the yoga classes, you can record those classes um, and then you can sell access to the, those courses in the future too, or, or put them on YouTube and, and have, have it be a, a promotional type thing where people find out more about your, your business by, by reading uh, or, or watching those videos, you know? Yeah. I, I think that's a genius idea. I would love it to see. Uh, I'd love to see if someone took that upon themselves to, you know, it with a restaurant and say, Hey, swing by yeah. anytime between seven and nine, pick up the ingredients. And then at 6 PM tonight, we're going to be going live and we're going to be walking through how to cook this in, in the comfort of your own home. But uh, I do have to say, I felt like you were speaking right into my soul when you said some people out there aren't great at cooking. So I don't know who you've been talking to, but you hit that right on the money. So if anyone has any good cooking classes out there, I guess send them my way. Um, so the, the last one, I've got a friend that's a dog walker. Any, any suggestions specifically with, with everything that's going on now, how they might be able to establish something that's a recurring revenue um, when a lot of people are home, a lot of people have the opportunity to walk their own dog. So any, right. any thoughts yeah. there? You know, a lot of people who might not have been working from home just a few weeks ago um, are now home with their, their dogs way more than, than they used to be potentially. Right. Um, and so they, there's probably starting to notice probably the same thing with the people in their house. They're probably starting to notice some of the behavior uh, issues that their dog might have, you know, during the day. Um, and so if you're a dog walker, you can maybe if you're also, uh, you know, trained in how to, uh, teach dogs, how to, uh, do certain things or whatever, you can offer like maybe online, uh, behavior classes, uh, you know, you can cover different topics like uh, how to house train your dog or how to keep them from, from parking when you're on a zoom call with, with your boss <laughs> or something, you know, um, I'm sure that if you're, you're in the business, you know, some of the pain points that people have or, or, or some of the the people, the clients that you have, uh, what some of the pain points their their dogs have uh, in terms of their their behavior, because you're around their dogs potentially more than than some of the owners are when you when you come and see them during the day and you walk them while the the owners at work or whatever. Um, so you might know some of those pain points. So you, you might be able to develop some some courses 
um, that you you can teach these people and, and then you can drop a subtle uh, hint to them. Say, hey, by the way, during this time, I'm, I'm offering this class on this issue. You might be interested, you might not, you know, whatever, but um, you know, you can probably come up with a few good topics and, and that might help, you know, bridge the gap at least, you know, between, uh, you know, during this time when, when people are staying at home, uh, you know, up until they, they get back to work. Right, right. I know with, uh, with my dog personally, if, if it feels like I'm not giving her enough attention she will just jump up in my lap. A 60 pound pit bull just jumps up in my lap and wants to be part of whatever call I'm on at that moment. So yeah. uh, I, I would also be interested in those. It, it sounds like yeah. all these classes we're talking about, I got to sign up for all of them. So uh, <laughs> everyone send me your links. Well, yeah, uh, that's, that's everything that I wanted to cover so far today. And I appreciate you coming on Scott. So before we sign off, why don't you tell everyone that's viewing uh, where can they find you? If they have any further questions, if they want to give you a shout out or wh where do they get in touch with you? Yeah. Uh, like I said, my, my business is Amplify Plugins. Uh, you can go to AmplifyPlugins.com. Uh, it's Amplify Plugins on Twitter uh, and Facebook and all the other socials. Um, you can reach me personally on Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn uh, at Scott Deluzio, S-C-O-T-T-D-E-L-U-Z-I-O. Um, and that's the same username on all the social uh, platforms there too. So, um, uh, should be relatively easy to find me there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where you can get me. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today, Scott. And thanks for tuning yeah. in everyone that, that, uh, participated. Really appreciate it. We'll talk all to right, you all soon. You. Have a good one. All right.